Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here with my co-host, Felipe Ernst. Today, we're speaking with Sandeep Nailball. He is the co-founder of Polygon, and he was last on the show in 2020, almost three years ago. Back then, the project was still called Matic and was sort of an idea that had not really been built yet. Obviously, lots of time has passed since then and lots has happened. And Polygon is now one of the largest ecosystems in crypto. And recently they announced Polygon 2.0, a brand new vision for the future of Polygon, which we'll get deep into here on this podcast. Uh, but before we do that, Sandeep, how are you? Well, thanks for coming on and uh, how are you doing? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me and uh, here. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing very well. Uh, very excited to, uh, very excited for this chat. Well, so are we. Um, obviously, like I said, you know, Polygon has become such a huge uh, part of the you know, broader crypto ecosystem, and certainly of the the sort of crypto narrative. Take us take us through the last three years, right? When you had this idea, uh, which was you know called Matic back then, which was uh, sort of the, one of the very early ideas for a layer two on Ethereum. What's you know how, how has your life changed in the last three years? So. You know, before uh, going into the last three years, it's like, you know, uh, but the starting of uh, poly Polygon or starting of Matic Network was basically, you know, I and my other co-founder, co-founders also, we were building apps, D apps actually on our, uh, this thing. Like, of course, we had some protocol level uh, understanding, but we were building D apps and we realized that, you know, Ethereum is not ready for scale. And, uh, you know, I also personally, like I am, uh, you know, sometimes I call myself like Web3 fanatic, like, you know, sometimes I question myself that, you know, am I giving too much of uh, or over indexing on how much the world needs this trustless decentralized world and all that. But generally, like I've been very, you know, kind of passionate about that, you know, this is the, this is the world or this is how the. Uh, the 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 next phase of the evolution of humanity is going to uh, happen, right? Like you know, we came from those empire states where the king was the god, right? Like king can do anything that he, that, that he wanted to do, and then uh, you know we had we came into these nation state systems where everything thing became an institution, government became an institution, and uh, people were electing the governments. But then you know those institutions also. Uh, in the last 40, 50 years with social media, we started realizing that, you know, how much corruption is there in these institutions. And time and again, they have proven, these institutions have proven to be prone to corruption and somebody who gets enough power, they start, uh, you know, misusing that power. And eventually, I feel that this is the third, uh, you know, stage of evolution of human systems, wherein... Uh, you know, these trustless uh, applications would be there and then even the businesses will be built in a community-owned, you know, as we say, community-owned businesses and things like that. And and they will, you know, empower, provide more freedom to individual human beings uh, in all the, in more aspects of their lives, basically. And somebody actually, Harvard uh, actually did a case study on Polygon and I was there and somebody asked me what, what exactly Web3 reduces the cost of. Like because every big technology reduces the cost of something. Like you know, cars reduces the cost of transportation. Um, internet reduces the cost of uh, you know information and all that. What does Web three reduce the cost of? And I said that Web three reduces or blockchains reduce the cost of freedom, the cost of providing freedom or cost of providing democracy into the system, right? Which is we know that how costly it is to you know have democracy. System. So that's where we started Matic Network. You know, uh, we we truly believed in this, and we realized that the infrastructure is not ready for building those kind of applications and businesses. So we went into that, and at that point in time, Plasma was a solution which uh, you know looked like okay, what the, was the hottest solution in that in the space, and we committed that okay, we'll build a layer two using Plasma, but with an EVM on the layer two. And in 2020, we launched the launched the chain. At that time, uh, we launched a version, working Plasma version. But then most of the people uh, did not use the Plasma uh, chain. People started using the EVM uh, side of the chains, uh, even like pure EVM uh, part of the chain. And then the chain 
actually even though the chain had plasma built in layer 2 built into that on that but most of the people used only pos chain right and then it kind of you know was the, was the you know kind of a you know this this, this confusion in the terminology whether it's a commit chain or it's a side chain or whatever it is but then the 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 usage kind of exploded and it became one of the biggest uh, you know uh, blockchains even now i think by daily active users and uh, you know by the number of applications deployed it's probably the biggest uh, blockchain but in the last but as i said that the vision was to provide this uh, web3 a scalable infrastructure and that infrastructure can only come in if you have single zones of security right like you know you don't have like right now as we have seen in the past like we have so many blockchains and we were just discussing before recording also that we have too much infrastructure not many apps right but those infrastructure when we say too much infrastructure that infrastructure is there but these are all die separate security zones and to connect them you have these uh, bridges and every other month we keep hearing that you know some of the other bridge gets hacked and things like that so essentially what i'm trying to say here is that even though we have a lot of block space that block space doesn't have one single unified security zone like each of the zones or each of the block space has a different security assumption and you know people need to use this third party tools and all that to do that so in order to achieve that web scale for web3 we believed uh, you know once we launched the chain you know we also evaluated optimistic rollups and we realized that optimistic rollups are kind of the uh, maybe the next stage but they are not the end stage because you know you are you have to put all the data back on ethereum and then you have to have a fraud proof it takes 7 days to have those fraud proofs uh, fully guaranteed is hard to build also those those fraud proofs like uh, currently uh, you know i don't think any layer 2 has a you know fully permissioned uh, fraud proofs only i think arbitrum people have uh, you know uh, permission fraud proofs but most of the other optimistic rollups don't even have any kind of proofs whatsoever so at that point itself we had decided in 2021 that zk is the end game and we wanted to go big on zk and then by that time like you know we in 2021 we merged or onboarded some of the top most zk talent in the space a merged one or two like hermes polygon like the hermes product project which was building a zk rollup they merged with polygon network similarly the mir protocol merged with polygon network and today we have two three di separate teams who were building it and uh, you know the benefit of these different different teams was that in the last 4 years peop- there's a multiple projects who have been trying to build these uh, zk rollups but having those multiple teams they were able to contribute to each other from different different angles and you know trying to uh, uh, were able to tell the teams that where can be some gotchas that you will find 3 months down the line and the result of that was that in march of this year 2023 we launched our first like first full blown zk evm which is audited fully mature source code and all that and we we launched it in march and uh, you know that is actually the first full blown uh, layer to uh, to exist uh, with with the with the validity proofs and uh, you know since then we have done like a lot of uh, leaps in the zk technology that we are building uh, some of our uh, zk technology uh, like a uh, plonky to uh, pill this is being used by large scale uh, amount of uh, developers all the all, all across the space whenever somebody is building on zk people are using this technology and you know like jordi i think you guys know jordi belina who's one of the co-founders at polygon he's built sarcom which is kind of the first uh, you know uh, uh, first programming language you get into when you start to build uh, zk circuits and things like that so yeah a lot has happened and now today polygon is a zk powerhouse and uh, as you as you said that one of the largest ecosystems in the space but the goal from here of polygon 2.0 is to is is the goal is same the mission is same how do we get web3 to the mainstream how do you how do we play this role uh, to get in the next evolution of humanity i call it web3.0 as humanity 3.0 so how do we play a bigger role in that and the goal is still the same that you know how to provide this infinitely scaling infrastructure for web3 which also has uh, you know same security zones so that the value can move inter- seamlessly from one place to another uh, you know meaning that the entire block space uh, should look like one single blockchain one single block space instead of like you know you 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 kind of uh, you know moving your value or bridging from one chain to another and things like that kind of getting the similar kind of qualities that the web2 today has for information it's infinitely practically infinitely scalable 
but it is also uh, you know seamless same same case with web3 infinitely scalable block space but seamless movement of value that is what is polygon 2.0 that's the whole journey cool so i think i understand the value proposition for polygon 2.0 um in a nutshell um how, how will it look or how will it be designed so, just so we can kind of deep dive into the individual um bits later absolutely great question so it's very simple like you know so we believe that under the fundamental layer of this trustless uh you know world web3 is ethereum and that's where the most of the value will be created or more than created i would say most of the value will be secured right and so that is the settlement layer where where, where all the value is being settled secured and and things like that but on top of that you will have hundreds and hundreds or maybe thousands or millions of chains which will connect back into ethereum using some sort of a proving mechanism which we believe that zk uh and most of the biggest researchers in the space believe that zk is the end game for that so you know you prove all of the execution on all of these chains back on ethereum and then because every chain is proving the zk uh, their execution back on ethereum the value can move to and fro between these chains just by relying on those zk proofs right so that's the simplest idea about it and between these chains and now how it will look is that you know you have ethereum you have hundreds and hundreds of these chains all of them are proving back to ethereum and they can rely on each other and the value can seamlessly move between each other so all these chains connected to this common bridge or zk proving layer which currently we call it lxly bridge but we are moving it to an aggregator layer so it will it will be aggregated together and with it, with that aggregated layer all these chains connected to this aggregator layer will feel like one single value network right instead of just like the way internet feels today like you are sitting in somewhere in europe i am sitting in uae we can create exchange share this information same way uh, you know with polygon 2.0 we believe should be possible for the value infinite amount of scaling more blockchains more applications need more block space they can spin up and dedicated block space also not publicly shared block space they can spin up their own chains but their value is still secured anybody can trust their value uh because it is being zk proven on ethereum and then that value can move around cool so we'll deep dive into the interoperability part of this later let's kind of um look at the zk part first right so we see there's two different chains that are in principle possible and that you guys also operate right or are go going to operate there's kind of the zk evm which is kind of the full full blown roll up with all costs associated with it um and then there is the so called validium which you which you're transitioning um polygon pos into um maybe let's kind of back up for a second what is a validium so what's the distinction between a validium and a zk roll up essentially when you are doing this these layer 2 scaling what you are doing is you are having some computation some somewhere off chain so and then you just prove back on ethereum so you don't have to do the execution or the computation on ethereum and then uh, it is happening somewhere else but ethereum is still securing it and primarily to to prove the computation fully that like you have actually two things like, it, like let me take it with optimistic rollups first in optimistic rollups you need to have both two things the two things are the proof of the execution and then the second is uh, the data like what were the individual transaction data was right and with optimistic rollup because it is by by nature it's optimistic it's assume everything is correct so what you have to do is you have to take the whole data put it back data on the on ethereum and also put put the state proofs and all that and then you assume that at optimistically everything is correct but if something is wrong somebody from the community can come and you know uh, do this thing called fraud proof right and run something of that's why you have to take you have to you have a withdrawal delay of 7 days from optimistic rollups because you need to give enough time for anybody in the public to come in uh, you know raise a contest or uh, you know raise a fraud a proof on 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 ethereum whereas with zk with zk what we are doing is and this is the power of uh, the the magic magical power of zk is that you can have millions and millions of computations on some off chain layer with zk you can have a very concise uh proof of that computation and just prove it back on ethereum 
it's called validity proof. It's not called fraud proof, it's called validity proof. The moment an Ethereum smart contract, validity smart contract, accept the validity proof, you can, you know, you everybody can be rest assured that all the execution, the 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 computation that has been done on that layer two has been done as per the rules of consensus, right? And so immediately you are hundred percent sure. So you don't in case of ZK rollups, you don't even need data on Ethereum to prove everything, right? So you can keep the data off chain, which is called Validium. So in case of optimistic rollups or even ZK rollup, when you want to keep the data also on Ethereum and the proof also on Ethereum, it's a rollup. And when you keep proof on Ethereum and data somewhere off chain, that is called a Validium, right? And Validium in case of ZK, because whole computation is being proven on Ethereum, it is as secure as rollup in terms of security. Only difference is like there is a one particular attack vector that they say, which is a very corner case of an attack vector where a particular sequencer or a operator is running a validium and that validium, uh, you know, stops or, 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 or kind of starts hiding the data. It doesn't show the data to the users because users need data to exit the platform, right? So it's called ransom attack. So user, the sequencer in case of optimistic rollup, they can steal the user's fund. But uh, because of the fraud proof, that is only protected using the, using the fraud proof. In case of ZK rollups, the, the, the sequencers cannot steal the user fund. They can't touch it. All they can do is, if the data is not on-chain, they can hide the data, uh, stop showing the data, and try to do this ransom attack to the user, where they say, you will give me this much money. If you have $1 million, give me 200 k then I give you 800 k back or something like that. So this is a... But then there are multiple mechanisms these days where you have forced, uh, you know, transactions and things like that. And it can, like, you know, people are building these solutions where if the sequencer is not giving you your money, you can sequence your transaction first on the chain. And even if the ransom attack occurs, like, you know, the 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 sequencer has to process your transaction. So there are multiple ways, but there is still a very small element of this small data availability. So, but which can be extremely minimized if you have a decentralized set of sequencers there. And with ZK, that is possible, right? So we were even discussing, like, imagine Gnosis chain starts proving back on Ethereum, right? And Gnosis chain already has hundreds of, like, you know, I think 45,000 or like, you know, some insane number Gnosis chain has, like, yeah, in terms of... Yeah, Gnosis chain has 140,000 validators. 140,000 validators. So, you know, if these validators are running this chain and they are proving back on Ethereum, the data is also fairly decentralized. Like, you don't need to rely on... So, so that that validium is almost as secure as like not theoretically but practically as secure as a full blown roller. So that's the only position. May I kind of just back up and kind of try to explain uh, the attack in slightly different words? So basically, what you kind of need to kind of exit a chain by forced inclusion is you need the exact state of the chain, right? And kind of if you want to go from um, checkpointed image to checkpointed image, you kind of you need to know um, which transactions have happened in since the last state, so you can reconstruct the exact state. And if if basically at, at, you know one transaction from from that entire set is missing, you can't reconstruct the state, and you can't kind of force um, an exit, which is kind of the attack vectors, right? So basically, it's kind of it's 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 I I agree that it's somewhat tenuous and it kind of also um, requires um, the collusion of two thirds of um, the validators, which in your ca case would be uh, sixty seven. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I, I totally I totally understand that. And also, if you kind of look at the costs associated with being an L2, the majority of the costs actually come from the data availability. So basically, just posting everything at score data at the moment, or basically uh, posting everything, um, you know, a, a, in a in a data blob. Uh, as soon as we have uh, dank sharding, um, it is um, the lion's share of the cost. It's like 99.9% .9 or so of the cost. Only like 0.1% of the cost or so is the actual proof of the state. As you said, basically what you can do is um, you can prove that the state is correct. But malicious actors might still be able to kind of um, freeze the chain. But uh, basically, that's the best they can do. They can't steal anything. Okay, so I think now we kind of have um, have established very clearly the the delineation between um, a validium and a zk rollup. 
So th there's this um, there's this diagram that the Celeste team has put out, and that I think a lot of people have seen. It's like it's this chart where you have on one axis like Ethereum centric uh, applications and Celestia centric applications, and on the other axis you have the different layers of the blockchain stack. So data availability, consensus, settlement, and execution. And then there's like the monolithic chain. You have rollups, validium. So I'm sure lots of people have seen this graph, and it's sort of it sort of shows the different ways that one can construct a blockchain with these different layers. I just want to get a sense of uh, where Polygon sits in this mental model. So for the ZK rollup, um, execution is happening uh, on the Polygon ZK rollup, but consensus, settlement, and data availability are happening on Ethereum. With Validium, the data availability is on Ethereum, and then the consensus, settlement, and execution are part of the Polygon stack. Is that correct? In case of Validium, the proving settlement is on Ethereum, but then right. data availability, in case of like, you know, Validium, especially let's say, let's talk about Polygon POS chain, which is one of the examples, right? In case of Polygon POS, you have 100 validators. And these 100 validators can buy, you know, can as well serve as data availability, you know, members of this chain also, right? So these validators are only proving on Ethereum. So settlement is on Ethereum, but the data is... Is, is on Polygon POS chain, right? But then if you see other Polygon, uh, you know, chains, for example, let's take an example of ZKEVM. So ZKEVM, both the data and proof are going to Ethereum. It's a full-blown rollup, right? Now, the execution is single sequencer, but that we want and we will be decentralizing this, the execution of this ZKEVM chain. So there will be multiple ZKEVM executors, right? So in this case, consensus will remain off-chain, but the whole data and the uh, proof will remain on Ethereum. In case of Polygon POS chain, only settlement is on Ethereum, but the consensus and data availability is off chain. Similarly, you can have some other kind of, uh, let's say you talked about Celestia, a kind of chain which is which has single sequencer, which puts the proof on Ethereum, the settlement layer, but puts the data on Celestia or any other data availability chain for that matter. Its own data availability layer or its so even Polygon ecosystem with that staking hub and, you know, uh, and we'll talk about that like in multiple roles in the Ethereum Polygon ecosystem. In Polygon ecosystem, uh, the validators will also be offer, able to offer uh, this role of data availability. We call them DAX, right? You know, they can be LDAX, local data availability committees. Because if you are running, let's say, gaming app like you know your ga game is a small game you still want the value to be fully secured by ethereum but you don't want all of your data you know being put onto ethereum l1 or like you know some other global layer like even celestia that will also become costly if it starts getting filled enough right so essentially you might need your own like five or ten validators which are providing very low cost data availability to you and when your scale is small you are happy with that once you start becoming let's say from 10,000 users to a million users to a 10 million users, you might want to change your data availability assumptions. And we want, like, just like on AWS, you know, when your startup is growing your com or your product is growing, you change the configuration of your servers and improve it as per the, uh, uh, you know, the configuration of the, the, the users need. Similarly, we also want that Polygon uh, for the developers to have a full-blown stack where they can change these con configurations as they go along. So, so yeah, these are the different, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, configurations where we uh, kind of want to play a role is obviously is on the execution layer where the validators like, you know, we believe that a lot of like app chains, for example, Immutable X, which is one of the biggest gaming players, they use all the Matic validators on their chains. So they want their chains to be Matic validated, but still be ZK proven on Ethereum. So they, that's a double kind of benefit. So they want to be Validiums, but decentralized validiums with Ethereum as the final settlement layer. Uh, you have, uh, you know, many other chains where they have their own set of validators, but they just use Polygon to settle back on Ethereum, like Polygon ZK proofs. So these proofs, so for that, let me introduce this concept of, especially as a part of Polygon 2.0, aggregator layer. So the aggregator, like in the, in the current setting, let's say you have 100 chains, all of them are proving on Ethereum. Some of them have Matic validators, some of them have single sequences, some of them have their own consensus mechanism, own validators. All of them are proving on Ethereum. 
and everybody is proving let's say every half an hour so everybody has to pay ethereum gas fees for half an hour proof right which can be fairly costly 50 to 100 dollars and then you know they are able to prove only 30 minutes so any kind of interoperability we call it lxly bridge needs minimum 30 minutes because once you put the proof then you can move your funds around the other chains so but with the aggregator layer what we are introducing is because we we have plonky 2 which is the fastest recursion recursion library right you know you can combine zk proofs into one zk proof so with this aggregator layer what will happen is all these chains can submit their proofs to this aggregator layer where it will be aggregated like let's say 1000 chains 100 chains all of them put a proof those 100 proofs get aggregated and just one proof gets goes back on ethereum so the cost of proving to the chains becomes extremely uh, low now and what it enables is now the chains then can prove every 10 seconds 20 seconds so the cross chain interoperability between the chains become much much faster because the moment you are on chain number let's say you are on imx game chain and you are playing a game and you you made thousand dollars playing that game on those tokens and now you want to swap swap those tokens on to let's say gnosis pay chain for example which is let's say assumingly it's connected or or you want to swap it on zk evm so you know the moment your chain the game chain publishes the proof 10 minutes uh into this aggregator layer now you can take this zk proof and go to the, the other chain which has the visibility of the aggregator layer and the proof has come in they can actually run your cross-chain transaction quickly and then you can take it back in 20 30 seconds and that is the ultimate goal of polygon 2.0 wherein you are on your own chain wherever you are playing game and all that you don't even care where, where your money is you just do like okay swap and then in 20 to 30 seconds just like ethereum blockchain main chain kind of finality somewhere else you use the liquidity somewhere else it gets swapped and you get the usd back on your on your chain so again as i was saying that all these chains should feel like one single chain. so that's where the polygon wants to play the role some on the execution layer but mostly also on this aggregator layer where all the proofs are being aggregated and the value as we say value layer of internet like you know we want to play at the value layer of internet where all these chains are providing this execution layers and then Polygon is allowing that information or value to seamlessly flow, flow across these execution environments. I, I think you kind of already touched on this, but can, spell it out first. So basically, if you if you kind of talk about like these two um, different scenarios of kind of user sharding and application sharding. So basically, the first being where the user kind of lives on one chain and kind of does everything on that chain, where, whereas the second is kind of different applications live on different chains and users kind of um, seamlessly switch between those two. Do you fall into the second camp, I assume? Yes, yes. I mean, I also see like one important part of Polygon 2.0 is we don't want to be we we try we have tried to be as less opinionated as possible. Like if you see in the current internet 2.0, like which we call Web 2 World, the protocol TCP/IP, which actually ended up becoming the backbone of this whole internet, is the least opinionated uh, plat uh, you know protocol, right? So what we believe is our job is to provide the seamless and secure movement of value across these chains, right? So. Our architecture doesn't put a very strong opinion on that, whether all of the things should happen on one chain, like all applications should exist on one chain or they exist on other different chains. What we believe, what I believe is more of a more practically uh, what will happen, what will end up happening is that you will have some of these public chains which will have massive amount of liquidity, people swapping and doing some very high high value stuff. But then apps, each of the apps, because apps want dedicated capacity, right? You guys are building this amazing, like, you know, Gnosis Pay, uh, you know, system where you want users to be able to pay within a millisecond, right? So you do a click and then, okay, pay and pay, payment happens. So you would want dedicated capacity for your chains. Like you would not be looking to have a, you know, scenario where there is a, you know, some NFT big mint is happening and now my payments are taking you know, 50 minutes, 50 seconds to go through, right? So people need or applications need dedicated capacity and their own uh, scalability space to exist. Some of the chains will be, like we believe, like, and this, you know, IMX will be the first uh, kind of we feel, feel it will happen is that they will themselves be a cluster of chains, 
right? Because they have 150 AAA games. Even if one of them explodes heavily, that chain, that game will acquire or kind of like, you know, uh, will occupy the whole chain itself. So what I, what we believe is public chains, lot of liquidity, some high value stuff going on. App chains, long tail, short tail, very, 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 very big uh, kind of ecosystems. Plus, then you have these ecosystem chains where some of the ecosystems, like there's a gaming ecosystem, there is a social network ecosystem and all that. And it's like, it, these will act like more like servers. Like, you know, like Twitter is not running on one single server somewhere, right? Like it's running on hundreds and hundreds of these coordinated servers. And that's what, so we want, we wanted to have that it, internet, the, the way internet has grown today for information, we wanted to have that architecture in mind. And that's one of the reasons how Polygon 2.0 Poly looks like this. So I don't fall in any camp. Like, you know, I believe that the world will look like a very mesh space. Some of them will be, you know, kind of dedicated chains, app chains. Some of them will be ecosystem chains. Some of them will be high liquidity public chains. Let's talk about tokenomics a little bit. So how does Polygon 2.0 impact the economics of the network? And I guess maybe a broader, more high level question is here is how does Polygon make money and you know, fund itself as a chain and as an ecosystem? Polygon e ecosystem, uh, basically when we started as Matic Network, that time the plan was to have one single chain. Even we had not thought through like, you know, I mean, uh, of course we knew that it will become a multi-chain scenario eventually, but we at that time the token economics and everything were designed for a single chain. And, you know, now uh, with this, uh, hyper blockchainized world that we are looking at like you know in next one and a half two years I feel that there will be hundreds and hundreds of these chains there are already hundreds and they will keep on growing like this and uh, the token actually should reflect that ecosystem so how we have uh, you know like wh what we call pole token which is the you know upgradation of Matic token it's not a new token Matic token will simply upgrade into pole token and you know, we call it like this third generation hyper productive token. Why why we call it call that is that you know it started with BTC. Like for example, BTC as a BTC holder, you cannot do anything with BTC. You can't stake it into the network, you can't provide the security to the network with that. This change this was changed with Ethereum, where Ethereum as a token, like you know, now you can stake into the network, try to provide this the the security into the network, and uh, you know, you can earn the yield on that. And the, the kind of token Polygon is is becoming, and we believe that you know many of these infrastructure protocols will become like this. This is the third generation token, wherein you can not only validate on one chain, you can validate on hundreds and hundreds of chains. You can stake once and validate on multiple multiple chains. Kind of like the you know we call it multi staking mechanism, not like restaking, but multi staking. Like one place you circuit stake, then you you run multiple chains. So that's one part. So not only you can validate on multiple chains, you can also val you can you can also provide different kind of roles. So you can provide definitely a validator or sequencer role, but you can also provide a prover role, right? Like you know, eventually we intend to have a prover layer. You can also provide a data availability layer, uh, wherein you you know provide data availability to different different chains, and then finally you can also play a role in this aggregator layer, where you become an aggregator, and you know because this layer also will have to be decentralized. So uh, you know, these four different, different roles on, on this one. How, uh, you know, this becomes a sustainable effort, like how Polygon makes money. So this Polygon is a is supposed to be an open decentralized protocol. So this doesn't have a revenue per se, right? But with, with, with Pol uh, token, what we have proposed is we have proposed 1% uh, inflation per year, which is like, you know, almost like Ethereum kind of uh, inflation and less than Bitcoin inflation which goes to the validators. Like all the validators who are validating, they will get this particular part of the uh, inflation. But second part is that uh, the, the the second part is the ecosystem growth treasury or something like that. So for that, we have proposed for next 10 years or community can decide 2% for 5 years or 1% for 10 years or whatever. We have decided that, you know, there will be 1% token treasury, token inflation, which will be used to grow the ecosystem back. And eventually there can be mechanisms where validators actually donate some part of their transaction fees or whoever is making any kind of revenue, everybody donates. But there is no way to force that fees as of now. Like at least we are not clear right now 
how we can force or, or like the net it can be built into the protocol where everybody has to do it uh, and in future like you know if, you, if it becomes exploitative you are taking 10% the validators can simply say we are hard forking and we don't want to pay this 10% transaction fees right so uh, right now that's the only way that there is this inflation for the growth of the e uh, protocol uh, but e in future there can be some donation mechanisms also where validators will donate or the revenue makers will donate to the ecosystem but we will you know for 10 years we believe that this infrastructure wars are going to stay for next 3 to 5 more years max it's almost kind of over it's very hard for new infrastructure players to now come and you know start a chain ecosystem from day zero you know in 3 to 5 years they are going to be settled and in those 3 to 5 years we are going to uh, you know we believe that this ecosystem treasury is good enough and post that it can become a fully uh, community run non uh, you know non single party uh, or, or non uh, you know kind of incentivized growth just like we see ethereum is almost reaching there there's only one network bitcoin which is able to do this ethereum also like you know foundation has to spend like i think 80 100 million dollars as per their last report uh, to grow the ecosystem but eventually like in in 3 4 years i think ethereum will reach the place where they don't have to spend any money as foundation same we also believe that in 5 6 years following on or 10 years it will it will reach that place what what will um the staking ecosystem look like for Polygon in the future? So basically, currently there's a set of a hundred validators, and there's yes. an application to kind of become a validator, and there's like some checks and stuff, right? So is that gonna be decentralized? Is that gonna gonna be opened up? Yes, absolutely. So currently, all these validators are not Polygon validators; they are Polygon POS validators. They only validate Polygon POS chain. But now we have multiple chains. And what we are going to do is we are we have we have we call it staking hub. So the staking hub will be will live on Ethereum. So you own Matic tokens, you stake on Ethereum, and then once you have staked your tokens into the network, now you can subscribe to different different kind of chains. So you can subscribe to Polygon POS. You can subscribe to when zk EVM becomes uh, decentralized or IM exchange and this and that. So all those kind of staking lo logic and mechanism can happen on. Uh, on Ethereum uh, uh, for you. So that's how it will look like. It will be a permissionless ecosystem. Anybody who has any Matic, they can stake and then they can choose to validate on any chain uh, where they can, you know, on their transaction fees. Very simple and very open and permission uh, permissionless. Cool. And this multi-staking, I mean, as you said, it sounds pretty similar to restaking and restaking has been um, somewhat contentious in the Ethereum uh, Twitterverse um, over the last year or so with people claiming that it kind of overloads um, the consensus. Um, are you worried at all for Polygon that uh, similar things might happen? I think like the, the the bigger problem with the current restaking mechanism like Eigenlayer and, and things like that on Ethereum is that it's extra protocol. It's not a part of the protocol itself, right? So the, it introduces a lot of additional kind of risks into the system, which where the system or the base system can lose control of if, the larger amount of economic value is coming from these networks. You know, it can create very crazy scenarios where, uh, you know, the protocol loses. It goes out of hand for the base protocol. In case of Polygon, it is a part, it's an enshrined restaking. Like, you know, you can think of it like that. So the protocol can enforce any kind of socioeconomic mechanisms like slashing and all that at one central place in the protocol itself. So it's that's why it's very different. It's like enshrined restaking in a way, if you have to say that. So where we believe is like, you know, it's fairly uh, much more secure than, than the extra protocol restate. I'd like to talk about the protocol architecture a little bit. So on, in your documentation, you have this staking layer, the interop layer, the execution and approving layer. We haven't really talked about interop so much yet. So can you tell, tell us how interoperability will happen uh, between applications in the Polygon ecosystem? Talk a little bit more about the protocols there. And you know, I'd like to, you know, after that, talk a little bit more about interoperability in the broader sense, uh, in terms of connecting Polygon to other ecosystems. So, yeah, maybe starting with the interop layer within Polygon and, and broadening it out a little bit uh, outside the ecosystem. Absolutely. So, I actually, you know, use this word aggregator layer before. Like interop layer is actually that aggregator layer only, which I was explaining that you know all these chains currently, and this is already built out today. So all the chains who are using Polygon Provers, they can connect to Poly Ethereum and we call it LXLY bridge. 
So you can move from any chain to any chain once you have submitted your ZK proof uh, without coming back to Ethereum. Like you, you can directly jump from one chain to another because uh, you know there is a master smart contract on Ethereum, master bridge contract where all the individual chain bridges are connected. So if you are moving something and you have put in a proof, you can actually directly move the value across the chains. But then this actually chain, this layer exists on Ethereum, right? Currently LXLY bridge which is very costly because all the chains have to put their proofs back on Ethereum and which is, you know, which can't scale beyond, let's say, 10, 20, 50 chains because it will become prohibitively expensive or very slow to uh, move funds around. So that's why we are introducing this interop layer or aggregator layer, we call it, where all the chains can submit their proofs back on this aggregator layer. And this aggregator layer combines all the proofs and just puts one, recursively combines one ZK proof puts that ZK proof on this one. So each of these chains are still like layer twos. They are directly connected. Once your proof has been included in Ethereum, you can move your value from your chain to Ethereum or your chain to any other chain in this aggregator layer, right? So the value can move freely without any need or need ex of any external bridges. Uh, and as I was saying that because of this aggregator layer, you can now prove much faster because this layer will be much, uh, you know, kind of uh, cheaper. So you can prove every 10 seconds to this layer. This combines and puts a proof back on Ethereum. But within those 10 seconds, all the chains have a kind of a partial proof of your ZK, right? Even though your proof has not been submitted to Ethereum right now in those 10 seconds, but you know you know that uh, this proof is uh, here and the chain has provided a valid proof or the, whatever that chain is. So you can have this interoperability, very fast interoperability, 10 to 20 second interoperability between these chains. So that's where, like, you know, we believe that the value can move around and uh, across chains. Yeah. And notably, you can have this level of interoperability also between low and higher security chains, right? You, depending on kind of where the, uh, how the data availability is handled for each of these chains, because each of them is going to post um, a, a ZK proof um, to the, uh, to this intermediate layer. Um, so do, do you foresee a future where kind of, um, DApps will kind of separate out components that are high security and components that are low security and kind of build DApps that live partially on a high security um, uh, roll-up and uh, partially on a validity. I think like, you know, that kind of complexity going on to the developers is very, kind of seems like unlikely. Like I feel that eventually you will have fair enough data availability, you know, kind of, I would not say global chains, but kind of clusters where you can have good enough data availability and everybody, like that's why I, I was telling you that we don't believe in a single data availability layer, but, you know, essentially with the same staking hub, somebody can actually launch a shared data availability chain, right? Which is basically five, like 100 people come in and you have a decent enough data availability and then people are, are sharing. But, also, this will be this cross chain value transfer will also, uh, you know, will also be governed by the individual uh, sequencers of a particular chain, right? Like, you know, they like users don't need to know about it, apps don't need to know about it. If I am an app which has an off chain data availability with one single sequencer, I know that the ZK EVM public chains uh, validators are not going to trust my value and they are going to wait for my transaction to go on Ethereum, proof to go on Ethereum, and only then, uh, you know, take my transactions uh, which are coming in, right? Or uh, for data availability also, there they, they will be some other mechanism. So, but the base layer of security for everyone is that ZK proof. So you are not cheating on the ZK proof. All you can do is, for some users, you can try to, you can hide the data and do all the kind of stuff, right? But for that, those users, the, the, the freedom is with the user. Right, like th the users who are are willing to rely on the token, right? Let's say there is a game chain, and that chain has one single data availability provider, and you have ten million dollars on that chain, which you are now bridging and you sold to someone else. So the other person who bought that token, right, that person is relying on some level of relying on some level of trust on your chain there because he's going to when he's going to claim, he is going to come to this game chain and ask for those ten million dollars. So I think the free markets will. You know, generally tend to take care of these things more because a particular chain or particular app 
will not grow beyond a certain point unless they decentralize their data availability a bit more. Their communities will put pressure on them that, you know, this is this is like uh, not a secure chain and all that. And they will fail to capture more and more uh, value on that on that chain. And they will have to, you know, decentralize their data availability. But I think for data availability, there will be multiple, multiple avenues for people to put. And, you know, L2 beats and these kind of like, you know, uh, catalogs will provide you decent enough uh, you know, a kind of security on the data availability side of things. Like I feel like, for example, once Ethereum has this data availability, like who's stopping Gnosis chain also to add 4844 to that, right? And with 130,000 validators, for a lot of chains, they will use simply Gnosis chain as data availability or people will launch layer twos on Gnosis chain to have data availability. And, you know, it will be on the users to trust that particular, how much to trust on that particular chain. So for us, interoperability, for us, the base layer is that ZK proving. And then beyond that, it's we leave it to the free market and, uh, you know, other uh, kind of social games uh, to solve. Unless something in data availability, some big explosion happens where you have data availability layer tools and things like that, then then we can we can see. So you were in Paris uh, during uh, HCC week and you attended OsmoCon and, uh, and also a modular summit. So, you know, my question is here, you know, what, what was the purpose, what was your purpose for attending these summits and, you know, what, what kind of, I didn't see your talk at OsmoCon, unfortunately, and I was like looking for it on YouTube, but I couldn't find it. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm curious, like how you see Polygon, you know, interacting with these other ecosystems and what is the role, you know, like you, you know, Polygon 2.0 builds itself as wanting to be the value layer for the internet. That, you know, when when you say anything that wants to be the something, it kind of feels, I mean, to me, I read it as like, it is the definitive thing and all these other things are perhaps going to, you know, perish or, or not be that important. So, you know, do you think that there is a role for multiple, you know, independent uh, layer ones, domains of state, application blockchains, and how do you see polygons sort of interacting with uh, these different ecosystems? And, you know, particularly, I'm quite interested in polygons interactions with like the cosmos ecosystem and uh and the celestia ecosystem yeah so i i think this is a very good call out like we should not call it the value layer like you know actually value layer of internet or we want to call it a value network or, or like you know we have to come up with then a like slightly better name this is the good call out that you know somebody will think the our vision is that these chains that we are talking about like you know on top of ethereum ethereum is the settlement layer but then on on the on on this other layer, I'm saying other layer. Some of them will be layer twos, but many of them would be sovereign layer ones also. Like right now in Cosmos, let's say a lot of Cosmos chains, and you know, big shout out to Cosmos community. Like I I think after Ethereum, like I always feel that if I could actually join some other community, being in Web three, it will be Cosmos community, no doubt. And uh, the, it's 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 super decentralized super uh you know cool and intelligent people over there but with cosmos chains what ends up happening is that most of these cosmos chains in themselves get a lot of traction but they are still kind of islands remote islands of liquidity they are not you know plugged in into the main liquidity layer of the of, of ethereum where the largest amount of liquidity is there so how we see polygon playing this rail is this aggregator layer is for example right now we have ZK proofs where any EVM chains, EVM ZK proofs, any EVM chain can prove uh, back on this aggregator layer. But we are already, you know, uh, seeing and helping other teams to build, let's say, ZK Wasm uh, kind of provers, right? So where you can prove a Wasm chain back on Ethereum, right? And all of these chains, so this aggregator layer then kind of enables free flow of information, a free flow of uh, value between these chains, whether it's layer ones, sovereign layer ones, uh, layer twos, single sequencer, multi-sequencer, own token stake, whatever it is. Polygon just wants to provide that central layer of, uh, that, that layer of value moving across these chains securely in a particular si single standard uh, value approval, uh, value mo movement across these chains. And, uh, you know, beyond that, leave it onto the free markets, as I said. Like, instead of we putting in a lot of, like, this thing now, all the chains should have Matic, like, we don't, we don't mandate on that. We, in fact, we believe few, like, 10, 20 chains will have Matic uh, stickers or, you know, few more than that. 
or app chains will have it but then the larger ecosystem like osmosis uh you know uh, a lot of other like you know cosmos ecosystem uh, other uh, layer ones which might be built on wasms and all that and right now there's a, this thing everybody is trying you know all the layer ones realize that they are in the remote islands of liquidity they need to be kind of layer twos we don't we believe that you know they don't even need to be layer twos they just need to settle onto ethereum uh and and you know like that's good enough for their liquidity like basically this kind of bridging provides them a trustless bridge zk bridge to ethereum right and after that they have their own sovereignty and they they can keep growing their ecosystems as they want to grow but the value can move to and fro uh, very frequently around uh, them so so this idea that everything should sell to ethereum i mean it in it, it makes sense i think uh, on the face of it but you know, I I I, th I think that there's there's also a case to be made that you know if if blockchains are going to secure you know, most of the value in you know the economy, that resiliency means also having other uh, other things to settle on, right? Like other blockchains to settle on, and obviously like Bitcoin and Ethereum have the most security and are. Uh, are are the the largest say like sh um, points to which you know people could can settle? Do do you think that this argument makes sense though? That that we need more kind of you know layer one layers of state uh, in order to have a more robust and um, and secure you know, world global financial system running on blockchains. See, conceptually, obviously, you know, you need decentralization on decentralization itself, right? Like, you know, resiliency, like, actually, the whole purpose of Ethereum blockchain or Bitcoin blockchain to have be decentralized is that then you don't have to rely on one single party. So when you are, even if, even though we are saying Ethereum as a collective one layer, but it's actually a layer which is highly, highly decentralized, same case with, with Bitcoin. But I feel that how the world or the in practicality how it plays out is there will be always in in today's financial world also like us dollar is the base layer of value right largely but then let's say 70 80% but then you there 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 are other value uh, layers also like you know gold other some of the other sovereign currencies and all that they also have value people trust some of that value but then if you see because finance has this great like I know that there's this great saying that liquidity begets liquidity. And especially in a larger and larger globalized world, you need free flowing liquidity, uh, you know, across these uh, applications or, uh, you know, across the world, across the economies. And I think due to that, you know, the network effects of a single liquid layer uh, become larger and larger. So even though I can say that, yes, there will be like, it's okay to have other layers where the value will be trusted and will exist. But I think the large percentage of that will still be governed by one single layer and which seems to be like right now Ethereum. Like unless like, let's say Bitcoin tomorrow comes up with a mechanism where now you can have validity proofs on Bitcoin and now you can settle. And as of today, like Bitcoin is like still much bigger than Ethereum in terms of its global brand and all that then that might be a you know formidable competitor for ethereum but otherwise like i i find it really really hard for any other layer to become that settlement layer fringe settlement layers sure but main settlement layer i think uh, it's like the pareto rule right like you know one of them will have the largest uh, share which is ethereum cool Seb, you don't like hearing this right um <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think this makes total sense. I, I, I think it's like a, it's a perfectly, you know, sound like, yeah. I think, I think do, things do aggregate. I think like aggregation theory, you know, exists also in blockchains, and and certainly there's going to be aggregation, um, you know, to to, to you know, the larger sediment layers, whether that's Bitcoin or Ethereum, and that they're you know, much like you know, I, I do like this nation state idea, and you know, Study talks about this a lot too, like you know, blockchains in the context of something like NATO. Um, I think one one thing I would love to see happen is this idea of shared security also um, expanding outside of like what's currently you know a, a very kind of small uh, network of chains within Cosmos to um, to you know different ecosystems right where like different ecosystems are also uh, layer ones are also securing each other in this NATO like fashion uh, and I know we're very far away from that happening but uh, I think it's like a laudable goal to to want to move towards. 
I, I want to bring this kind of full circle. In the very beginning, you kind of, you talked about kind of the thing that blockchains kind of lower the price of, and you said you think it's democracy. Um, so tell us what kind of applications you foresee having actual, actual, you know, no me users on blockchains in the, you know, coming years. So what kind of things in the future will settle on blockchains um, and why? I think like, you know, for the next three to five years, you will you will still see blockchain largely confi confined to the financial sector only. But I also definitely believe that this is the best financial rails that, uh, you know, humanity has ever seen. And eventually, most of, if not all of finance will move on to these rails. So I personally feel that initially, the, the, the use cases where they require value to be transacted and value to be uh, held, shared, exchanged, these cases, uh, you know, will be way more. So obviously DeFi is a, is a segment which is automatically we, we understand. But then, for example, gaming also. Gaming also, like these days, gaming is like one, like what's the number? Like I think $150 billion uh, revenue or something like that in US itself. Like there's a Netflix documentary which talks about like, you know, the gaming in US is bigger than Hollywood, uh, basketball, NBA, NFL, NHL, everything combined, right? So, and these are like digital only uh, things. So, and value exists over there. Like people transact billions and billions of dollars in value over there. So, uh, they definitely, it makes much more sense. Similarly, uh, only one or few use cases uh, that I feel, uh, you know, for blockchain right now have started emerging is may maybe some form of this... Uh, uh, you know, your social network use cases, right? Like where, because people are, as I said at the, in the starting of the program that what blockchain reduces the, reduce the cost of, they reduce the cost of freedom, they reduce the cost of democracy. And, uh, you know, for these social networks, we definitely, uh, you know, it, it, these are kind of social network apps are kind of the peak of the applications which need this freedom and democracy, you know, starting now actually. So I feel that that could be one segment also, apart from DeFi and gaming and other value-related use cases like RWAs. Like when we say DeFi is like kind of the niche finance, but then the RWA or traditional finance and, you know, some of the people, uh, you know, in, in the in the Canto space, like their leaders, uh, Scott Lewis, uh, you know, is coming up with more like, you know, ni nice, nicer names for this, which attracts this traditional finance into this. But basically that, like, you know, DeFi, gaming, uh, RWA or traditional finance use cases and, you know, even stock markets, you know, moving over to uh, this thing. Like right now we have these stocks and all that, like there's a large amount of management goes in the background for clearing houses and all that. Blockchain actually obliterate most of that, uh, you know, use cases because you, you are actually settling uh, real time uh, to the end user itself. So, so that plus... Like the only non-financial use cases I am seeing is, is is in the social side. So those would be the larger like kind of focused applications currently. Okay, one more thing is basically NFTs. But NFTs, you can argue that they also have value. But I feel that NFTs have a huge, huge potential. I'm not talking about art NFTs and other things. NFTs have a huge potential. Basic PFP or some other kind of NFTs have huge potential to get to serve brands. Because I, I talk about this term or like, you know, I came up with this term called effective EAT, like E-A-T, effective attention time, right? And for brand, it's super important. Right now, brands are like, you know, fighting for this uh, user's attention span, right? So, you know, active attention span for them, for brands is super important. And uh, that is where I feel that these NFTs can play a very big role, like Starbucks NFTs that you see. Reddit is doing very well in those NFTs and many many brands will will utilize NFTs to you know kind of have brand campaigns which brings them more uh, attention. So these are the only few use cases except finance I have. But in finance, whatever you see in finance, that that's a huge huge uh, market that sooner or later should uh, you know migrate toward blockchain based financial wins. What what needs to happen for that uh, in order for 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 that to actually take place because i i totally agree that kind of these are um the use cases where blockchain rails 
one hundred percent make uh, make sense. I mean, we are all on Twitter. We all know it's kind of not gotten better. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I I totally agree that basically this would make sense. But why isn't it happening at scale, right? I mean, so basically, if you look at actual users in the ecosystem, it's very few, if any. So basically, it's most of most of us we're kind of dog fooding stuff, but no one's kind of you know in earnest move to lens or anything what needs to happen for that is basically like we keep saying and at the start of the the recording also we are saying and this is becoming very popular amongst the vcs that oh web3 has a lot of infrastructure but then not many apps but i would argue against that i don't think that we have actual uh, deterministic scaling infrastructure for blockchains as of yet we have these separate separate blockchains today you can spin up hundreds of blocks hundreds of blockchains but then the fundamental point is having that aggregated liquidity or aggregated like you know value which then starts getting fragmented and each of these chains or each of these uh, block spaces are ineffective uh, you know end up becoming ineffective databases where the security assumptions are also separate so what needs to happen according to me is all these value should have a place to aggregate with each other like you know all, all the value should be aggregated uh, with each other across the chains and the security assumptions need to go down like security assumptions you should be have you should be having one single security assumption across all the chains right okay that you know the, the value cannot be stolen from me and execution cannot be done in a wrong way and i think and then i think slightly more slight more thing is basically smart contract security like you know we do we can't afford these many hacks that we go through but i think that's a kind of a learning cycle that uh, you know this whole space is going on. that's why ethereum's uh, you know zk evm or solidity you know network effects are also very strong because those smart contracts have gone through years and years and years of these hacks and battle testing any new blockchain you will bring in any new blockchain programming language you will bring in they also have to go through this and these network effects compound over time so uh, i believe that you know more security on smart contracts but yeah uh, like aggregated liquidity single security zones for everything it should feel like one single block space and you know more uh, robust smart contracts so polygon is um, probably one of the ecosystems in blockchain that has like really strong business development and that has been uh, a really big advantage in terms of getting uh, you know, contracts and sort of uh, getting you know, institutional and larger brands to come and use the platform. That's not the case in every ecosystem. I think there's like a gradient of, of you know, kind of centralized, coordinated business development and really like very decentralized, uh, uncoordinated business development. And I would put Polygon on one end of that and Cosmos and the Interchain on the other. And, you know, Avalanche falls in there somewhere, you know, like Solana and, and Ethereum also do to some extent. In terms of um, pushing technology forward and having the ability to like build tech that is robust over the long term, you know, which approach do you think will will you know, is likely to win out? And you know, one example, I think, like one example for the decentralized, um, more decentralized decision making uh, paradigm is Linux, right? And like Linux has always been a very decentralized government. Get decentralized in this. In, in the people who are building on it and also its governance and, and also like the business development. And it took a, a really long time, but you know, in the end, now after 30 years, like Linux is powering most of the world's server infrastructure, most of the devices we use on a daily basis. And that, I think that wasn't obvious that that would be the case like 20 years ago. So yeah, in that context, like how do you see that playing out? Yes, I think like, you know, there are two parts that I can discuss on the Linux uh Thing. like first of all i think linux technology was always decentralized and uh, always uh, like open source uh, which actually you know encouraged a lot of smart or the smartest people in the world to contribute to the operating system levels whereas like some of the other operating systems were very close source so they could never attract the talent in case of blockchain ecosystem the technology that level is actually at par because you know, even for Polygon, the the technology is open source and it's becoming more and more open source. Like, you know, with ZK and all that, we are also attracting a lot of ZK talent. So I believe that that gets compensated over there. 
but with 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 blockchains also if you see that blockchains which had early mover advantage like btc and ethereum they kind of survived and you know built those network effects uh you know in those days because there were very few uh you know kind of players in the space but then you know now if you see for any blockchain protocol to get any meaningful uh you know traction on it right they will they need to have some level of distribution because there is just too much noise in the in the ecosystem so you need some level of distribution but i also keep saying to to our team like for example polygon labs like which is you know one of the largest com- uh, contributors into this polygon ecosystem now although there is a very large part like for example all of these brand uh, you know brands that keep launching on polygon not many people realize that more than 50% or even 60% of them we don't even know that they are they are going to launch on polygon right so because now it's become like a kind of a uh, self propagating machine but uh, i feel that i keep telling to our polygon labs team also that our eventual goal is to kill ourselves right like we have to take it to a place but we also keep growing our uh, you know community and organic stuff and all that where polygon labs at one point in time ceased to exist or remains a very small contributor maybe maybe it still remains a small contributor 10 20% at that and all these models of you know these community owned businesses these are being done for the first time in this world like we don't really know how these community owned businesses right now we are talking about infra but what will happen to let's say a social media application right which comes which is a decentralized social media application i think they will always have a nucleus like or set of like one or two teams which are actually contributing to their core development like even for bitcoin you can argue that there is a core developer bitcoin core dev ecosystem same case with ethereum for development and then even for the you, i think your question is more directed towards the the business development i think for the application layer you will see that these community owned businesses kind of business models will evolve where there will be one or two entities in that ecosystem which will contribute to the to the nucleus of that uh, you know continuous growth and then you know the community will be contributing from outside but at least 20 30 40% 40%, you will see these teams so that's where like we also don't really know we are also playing this that as this ecosystem evolves it will be very wrong to say that we have a exact you know playbook that how they are going to do but if you see most of the current infrastructure protocols they are all adopting polygon's playbook like they all are trying to play something similar to what polygon uh, did while we because slightly being ahead of the curve like we are now you know kind of as we say progressive decentralization so we are kind of continuously reducing the footprint and increasing the uh, organic footprint but yeah like you know i mean obviously ethereum and uh, cosmos and bitcoin communities are super super like organic communities and you know for it, it's a dream come true for any protocol founder to have that kind of uh, community and we have to also change a lot like see when people say you might have heard also a lot of people saying like you know polygons a uh, business development ecosystem has been very uh, you know kind of aggressive or kind of very concerted concentrated and everything but then if you see that where polygon came from like polygon didn't come from this silicon valley background like it had no cre- like credibility like people most of for the first 2 3 years people considered polygon a scam right like because it did an io on binance and things like that right so so it had to fight hard but now you know we also realize that we have to make it more and more uh, organic and community growth and everything and then i think ecosystem as a whole is you know making those changes to become like you know become like great communities like uh, you know cosmos or ethereum or bitcoin so it's a, it's a work in progress great well i think that's a great note to end on uh sadeep thanks so much for coming back on the show and uh and sharing the vision for polygon i think it's really really fascinating and also so impressive you know the the growth of that ecosystem and what you guys have accomplished in the last 3 years and so i wish you and obviously the polygon ecosystem lots of success uh in uh in uh building out this vision so hopefully we could do this again uh, in the next uh, two or three years and polygon will be even bigger yeah hopefully yes thanks sir thanks for the keep thank you